Hello everyone, another video for you this week. For this one, I wanted to address the other discussion that we had last week of um, why do we hate reading for school. I always like to start the semester by asking students about things that they hate, um, especially about English class. There's usually, uh, you know, a lot of things that people hate about English classes, so I think it's a good place to start. And um, I also like to do this because usually I think a lot of the things that students kind of pick up on as being um, excessively annoying or, or the things that they really don't like about English class, I mostly agree with those things. And uh, I like to kind of show that and, and try to like find a way around uh, some of these problems, right? So I was asking specifically about reading stuff for school. So I just wanted to go through some of the responses I got there and some of the other things that um, I just kind of wanted to clear up uh, before we start um, actually reading uh, some fiction here and working on some of our own essays. So one that came up was the stories being unrelatable or old. Uh, definitely agree with this. Uh, I think I already said this, but we're not going to be reading any Shakespeare. We're not going to be reading anything excessively old. Uh, everything's going to be basically from the 20th century. I think we, have, we might have one story from like 1895 or something, but it's very easy to understand. So I don't like to waste time in a course like this where I'm really just trying to give you an introduction to like literature and, and what it means to study it and stuff like that and also do some composition stuff, right? But in that context, I don't think it makes sense for us to have to spend a lot of time parsing through like word choice and, you know, excessively difficult stories. Um, although some of the essays I give you might be a little bit difficult, uh, but I think there's better reason for that. So I, yeah, I think that's very important for a story to be relatable and, and I think uh, another way that these are going to be relatable, other than that they are more uh, modern and stuff, is that I think the frames that we're going to use to kind of analyze these stories are also going to make them relatable to our lives. We're going to be looking at stuff like gender, race, uh, sexuality, class, things like that. So I think by focusing on these sorts of issues when you look at fiction, it makes it more relatable because these are things that we care about anyway, right? So that's uh, just another note on that. But all the stories we're going to read, I think they're good, all right? I think they're good. I've tried. Another thing that I saw people say was the idea of teachers being, uh, like, pushy about the meaning of a story. I think that this is a big problem as well. I think this is something that really makes people kind of uninterested in, in reading uh, fiction in school. And that makes them feel kind of like alienated from the process of reading stories for school because you know you'll, you'll read the book and you'll think it's about one thing and then you'll te your teacher will tell you it's about something totally different and you missed all these symbols and these references to whole things and you know this, here's what it's really about and you're wrong because you didn't know all this and that understandably i think makes students be like all right well then who the fuck cares you know the story was kind of boring anyway i read it i thought i had a meaning but i guess i was wrong and it's it's really a, a fundamental problem because to start off with in a class about literature, you have to acknowledge that there's more than one correct answer to the meaning of a story, you know? There can be, uh, yeah, there can be multiple correct answers, right? But I think it's easy to fall in this trap. Like sometimes when I, I and maybe I noticed this a little bit in the discussion, but definitely when I talk to a class about this, they'll um, say that, well, it's subjective, right? Like I, I read it and this here's what I thought, you read it and you thought something else and you know, uh, it's, it's, it's just subjective, so we can't be wrong. And I think this can be dangerous, because then I think we start saying, well, any opinion is fine, because, you know, it's all just opinions, right? So so my opinion, you know, that the, the sky is uh, green or whatever, that's fine, because that's my opinion. It's just your opinion. Uh, I, I don't think that this is the right way to go. I do think that there are better and worse opinions that people can have, uh, and I think that at least a little bit we can kind of uh, see which is which and uh, be able to, to determine between them. And I think this is true for the meanings of story. Like, like I said, I think that there's not just one correct meaning, but I don't think that means any interpretation is correct. I think that the, the way we distinguish between this is evidence. Is there evidence to back up your interpretation of the story? How strong is that evidence? How much of that evidence is there? I think a lot of times with teachers, um, the evidence for their reading will be like, you know, one sentence, you know, or the fact that, yeah, a shirt was green instead of blue or, or whatever, or that it was spring when the story took place, and that will be their evidence for their interpretation. And I think we rightly see that um, as, as kind of, uh, you know, not satisfactory. So that just goes to say that there's not one correct answer uh, for the meaning of story, but that doesn't mean that every answer is fine. Uh, okay, the next thing. So just like I was saying about like colors or seasons, when people look like stuff like this in fiction, uh, I think that this is another big problem that connects to teachers thinking that they know everything about it. 
Um, and like I said before, I just in general don't think that I know everything and, and um, am more interested in what students have to say. Uh, but I think something else that teachers do that kind of aids them in this is by overly focusing on symbols. Things like colors, like, like stuff like that. Like um, if you've ever been uh, in, in a class where you read some story and, and the teacher says, you know, something like, uh, well, you know, since the, since the character shirt sure, was uh, gold um, and we all know that gold is connected to money, uh, that means that they uh, are greedy, you know. Or like the, the character shirt was green and we all know green's the color of jealousy so that that's the meaning of this I, I think we're all kind of we we all kind of know this is bullshit right i think we can all like our, our uh, you know our radar goes off like this nonsense uh, that you're telling me <laughs> and, and i think that's right so it's again we have to find kind of a middle ground a lot of this stuff comes down to finding some kind of like more nuanced middle ground um there are symbols in stories right the, i think that's undeniable that certain things are symbols but at the same time if we are symbol hunting, as I would call it, if we're looking for it, if we're going out of our way, if we're forcing it, instead of letting it just kind of happen naturally and observing it, uh, then we get into a problem. Uh, I, I remember, like, for instance, having to do an assignment about uh, Hamlet, and there's one scene in Hamlet where Ophelia comes in with a bunch of different kinds of flowers, right? And it's like roses and begonias and petunias or whatever, all different names of flowers. And I remember having to do an assignment where you had to go through and like find out the symbol that each flower was supposed to stand in for. And it was like rose, well, of course that's love. And, you know, chrysanthemum, well, that means memory. We all know that. So that kind of stuff to me is just nonsense, you know? Uh, and and I, I think that you've got, again, it comes down to evidence. These have to be persuasive arguments. We have to convince people. So we need uh, textual evidence. Uh, okay, so that's about the symbols. Another thing that bothers me, um, is focusing too much on the author's intention. And again, I think this is another way that teachers try to tell you that they're right and you're wrong, is because they're like, oh, well, actually this this author, uh, you know, they wrote a letter in 1852 where they said, this is what it meant. So that's what it means. Uh, and I just really think that's not satisfactory. And one of our essays that I'm giving you for homework uh, called The Death of the Author <laughs> is very much gonna deal with this idea of, of how much should an author be able to determine what the meaning of the story is, you know? Uh, like, I, I think about this with, um, like, J.K. Rowling, for instance, with, like, the Harry Potter books. Um, like, I remember after the Harry Potter books had been out for a few years, after the series was done even, I think, J.K. Rowling kind of came out and, and said, like, oh, the character of Dumbledore, like, he was gay the whole time. And, and like, the, the, the thing for me is, like, if, if you want that to be the case, then put it in the book. Right. Like if you're not going to put any textual evidence to support this, then I don't really know why I should have to listen to you. You know, just because you're the author to me doesn't mean that I need to take your opinion as, uh, you know, the sacrosanct uh, uh, like dictum about about what the meaning of the text. Um, but some people do believe that. I remember having to write um, an essay about uh, what's the book uh, to kill a mockingbird. And the assignment that I had for this was to write an essay about how To Kill a Mockingbird connected to the life of the author Harper Lee. So the whole essay was like, you know, To Kill a Mockingbird took place in the South. Well, Harper Lee also was from the South. And to me, that's just not interesting. Like, like why? Why does that matter? I don't know. So that's kind of what, what my take on that. And that's, that's another kind of annoying thing for me, I think, uh, with the way that this stuff gets taught. Um, oh, one other thing that I hate, reading quizzes. Uh, students, I think, will agree with me. I think all you will agree. There's nothing more frustrating than like having done the reading for homework and then you get into class and you have to take a reading quiz. And I remember having one where it was like the you, you, it gave you a bunch of different lines of dialogue and you had to say like which character said that dialogue. And I had done the reading and I, I couldn't remember, you know, like I read the story. I, I knew what happened generally, but I don't remember who said what necessarily. Uh, so then, you know, like you fail the reading quiz, even though you've done the reading. And to me, those types of things really just kind of show that the teacher has no trust that their students are actually going to do the reading like the only reason you do that is because you don't think they're going to do it <laughs> so for me i'll always try to frame things more in like a discussion right and that's why i'm so interested in doing the discussion boards and everything is that i, I want it to be about like like your opinions and ideas and not just did you do the reading did you do the homework um so so yeah that's just another thing i wanted to add on okay last thing here that I think is a problem for how we read fiction in school is that I think when we write essays, okay, well, maybe this is more about uh, writing about the things we read in school. When we write an essay uh, about a play or a story or a poem that we read, 
what, what is the point of that essay? What is the goal of that essay? I don't think we're usually, I don't think we usually have an answer for this. I don't think teachers have really given us an answer for this. And I think that's why it makes these seem so stupid. Uh, or it makes people feel like, oh, well, I'll just summarize, right? I'll just, I'll just tell you what happened in the story. So one big thing that we need to understand is the difference between summary and analysis when it comes to writing the kinds of essays we're going to be writing in this class. Uh, summary is obviously just telling us what happened in the story, whereas analysis is going to be connecting it to your argument. Um, so I'm gonna, I don't want to say too much here. I'm going to have another video about this later. Uh, but I, I think we need to have a better understanding of why we write these essays and, and just what the point of them is. I guess what I'll say right now, that the point of writing about a piece of literature is to make an argument about what you think the message of the story is. I'm going to repeat this a million times over the course of the semester, but we're making an argument about the message you see the story giving to the reader. Message, you could use a different word. You could say uh, it's your argument about what the takeaway is, about what the, uh, it's your argument for your interpretation, something like that. But the important thing here is that we're making an argument. We're not just summarizing. It's not a book report, right? Uh, you're going to have some summary. We need some amount of summary, right? Just to tell the reader, uh, remind them really of the things that happened in the story and, and for us to give evidence. But it's all going to be related to what our argument ultimately is. And we'll talk more about what kinds of arguments uh, we're going to be making in this class uh, soon. Um, okay, let me end this video by just kind of introducing the homework that I gave you. Uh, these are difficult essays. I gave you three essays to read for homework. Um, I think most of them are pretty short. One of them is like literally two or three pages. Uh, I, the other ones might be more, more like 10 pages. I, I know it's kind of a lot. Do your best with them. Uh, read through them as much as you can. Get out of it what you can. I, I'm giving these, even though these are extremely difficult readings, like I'm saying, I read these texts and I learn new things from them every time I read them. These are like the highest level uh, of what you would call uh, literary theory. So the reason that I'm having you read these is because um, this week we're going to talk about the question of what is literary analysis. I'm going to do another video about that, uh, probably right now I'm done filming. Um, next week we're going to talk about why should we look into literary analysis. So I'm just bringing this up now to say that I'm going to try to answer this question of what the point of these essays is. Um, so, so when you look at those ones for homework, like I said, they're super difficult. Don't be worried if you don't understand everything that's going on in them. Um, I'm going to have a video about all of them next week where, where I'll try to break it down for you. But I do think it's important to take a look at like the, you know, the original texts. Like um, th th these are people uh, writing a fairly long time ago, but they kind of set up like what literary theory now is. So I think there is a value to going back and looking at those. Um, so yeah, like I said, get what you can from them. I'm going to try to break it down. Uh, don't be worried if you if there's some words you don't understand or whatever. Just, uh, you know, try to keep going. And yeah, talk more soon.